When you remedy a deficiency, performance improves. That's true with vitamin D, that's true with glycogen, that's true with sodium, and maybe creatine was just kind of remedying that deficiency, but I don't see an increased performance in athletes who are already getting adequate, uh, like with Hofthor or Larry, that might even cause a problem because there's some cramping involved, potentially. If you're deficient, creatine tends to work for those people. If you're hydrated, it tends not to work for those people. That's the difference. So as far as uh, what I mentioned about getting adequate sodium and calcium in, that is another way to improve blood flow and um, blood vessel elasticity. So maybe some of those supplements wouldn't be as effective with those people. The stuff I'm talking about today, the very simple things I talked about today, can make huge differences in one week. A lot of these supplements, if you're deficient, if you're inadequate in some area, you might see a benefit. Milk was a good one for me, eggs, another good one for me. Those are inexpensive and still provide a, and then having uh, meal prep. Make sure you got what you need when you need it. The body doesn't work in peaks like that. You don't get strong from a huge workout. You get strong from stringing together a series of workouts consistently. When the body needs protein, it needs what it needs when it needs it. It doesn't need <laughs> this up here. Same thing's true with a lot of these people with these drug cycles. You know, it doesn't need 5,000 on your blood test and testosterone levels. It needs about, you know, 1,000 or 1,200. <laughs> it just needs what it needs when it needs it. You're not going to build it any faster. There's a, a process, you know, and it just takes consistency. So always have that available. It was one of the things in college that I always did was go in and, and prep my meals for the day in the student lounge in the morning. And same thing if you've ever seen some of my snippets from when I travel, I carry a bag that's just full of food. And when I had to fly to the UK, I had six meals in there, you know, to get me through. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm eating breakfast, okay, I'm gonna have to eat one more flight before I get on the, pl or one more meal before I get on the plane. And then every about two and a half or three hours thereafter. And then when I land, because it's gonna take me a while to get in my car and get to where I'm gonna go. And I map that out and I, that's how many meals I need. Along with a couple of this, that, and the others. And that's what I prepped for. So, and that's what I did with Hofthor too. He was traveling, HBO was sending him all over the world red-eye flights, landing at hotels with no kitchenette, no food there for him. So part of it, a big part of what I did with Hofthor was, was just uh, you know, time management, just planning ahead. People will spend an hour talking about their, their prep for their next meet, every rep, every set, every percentage of, here you're gonna do 65% uh, for a three by three, and then a two by two with 50%, and then a, you know, it's maddening to me that they'll spend that much time on something like that. But it pales in comparison to these very simple, seemingly boring, monotonous things that I talk about. Like, Stan sat up here and talked for an hour about sleep. But that's 100 times more important than your 65% of your one map <laughs> rep max for a 3x3. Three three. Uh, it, it just is. I found that when I did these things and I went to the gym, I could do anything I wanted. I didn't care what percentage it was of what. You know, I came to the gym every single week and outperformed the last week because of the things I did outside the gym and recovery. And all the guys in the gym follow me. I Stan, Stan, what are you doing? What are you, what, Stan, Stan, what are you, you know? And it's always, what are you taking? They always want to know. I'm, I wish that were the secret. You know, I went to every guru in the business and asked that question and discovered everybody's doing the same thing. And that the ones that are succeeding either have a, a genetic predisposition or they're putting in a lot of doing the basics really well. You can only grow as fast as you can grow, right? And insulin just shuttles more calories in you, and whether or not your body utilizes those, or you even need it because of some of the tricks and techniques that I just talked about as to your post-workout carbs. It's really what insulin's trying to do is the same thing we try to do with our post-workout carb, sodium, and, and caffeine drink, is trying to shuttle as much carbohydrates into the muscle as possible, as quickly as possible. That's what it's really trying to do. Uh, and if we found a way to do it without it, then we don't have to worry about its effect on the pancreas and maybe shutting it down and becoming diabetic, etc. I've known a lot of people over the years who've done a lot of it, and a lot of people over the years who've done none. And there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the two, except for the people that do a lot of it tend to end up with an enormous belly. Because the vast majority of those insulin receptors are on your large intestine. And that's what grows. <laughs> Look at Ronnie Coleman. I mean, there's a perfect example. You know, he looks pregnant from a lot of the insulin use and a lot of the calories, the carbohydrates. It's one of the drawbacks with an enormous amount of carbs is that a lot of those receptors are on uh, large intestine. And the voracious eaters, Kai Green is another example. There are adverse effects to that. 
I've always found that you can get an amazing result from much, much less than what most people would suggest. And fortunately, I learned that from Flex Wheeler early in because as Dorian Yates talked about back in the late 80s and early 90s, everybody thought when you went from one cc a test to two cc's a test that, that was a huge deal and you were going to shit a liver and you were going to, you know, die. And, but nowadays, that's like Monday. You know, two cc's a test is like Monday. Nowadays, when you look at the industry and the, the crazy things that people have, have been doing out there. And I've found, particularly in the last five years, today with our blood tests, I just got mine back and my testosterone was 970-something. And the month before that, it was 750. And the month before that, it was like 1,200. It moves around a little bit, but it's not 3,000 or 5,000 like some of the guys try and maintain today. And I'm not missing much. I'm just finding that my performance hasn't suffered really any other than the fact that I'm just a little bit older. I don't think you need to use a lot of it. I think that it's consistency and discipline, et cetera. To put a number on it, probably maybe five I use post-workout with your 100 grams of carbs. That would be the only time I'd recommend it, although some people recommend pre-workout. Because if you take it at a different time of day and the muscles aren't drained of glycogen, then where's that glycogen going to go? It's going to go to fat storage. I reached out when I was a young man trying to find out information, and I was fortunate that people would share that information with me, so I wasn't left just to kind of try and figure it out, because you shouldn't experiment, particularly with something like that. It can be dangerous. I don't want to, you know, over-exaggerate it. If I use an insulin post-workout with some carbs, you can enhance performance a little bit, sure, maybe. But possibly only if you aren't doing the things that you could be doing, like the recommendations that we've made in terms of my vertical dieting and the white rice and the post-workout carb drink with sodium. If you're doing that, you might not see much benefit from it at all. You might do what I suggested and get everything out of that. And it's not a huge strength thing anyhow. It really isn't. It's like GH. It's never a really big strength thing. Ronnie Coleman talked about that as well. He was just about as strong before all of that as he was after all of that. Another thing is, is the hydration, to make sure that I'm getting plenty of carbs, plenty of salt, and I don't do a lot of sugar. Now, when people do a weight cut and immediately coming off the scale, I give them that drink. 30 minutes later, I give them another one. After that, no more sugar for the refeed. Stay away from that. It stimulates the kidneys to release water. Next thing you know, you're pissing every five minutes. You start dehydrating, cramping. So you want to avoid that. And I've been there, this is from experience, <laughs> and I've worked with athletes who have been there and helped them not be there. Larry cramped up at a meeting at a meet so bad that he wasn't going to be able to bench after his squat. And that's, uh, you know, he was weight cutting, and fortunately he's not going to do that anymore. I, I suggested at his last meeting not, and he ended up cramping again. Got off the scale, went to IHOP, and just pounded down a whole bunch of calories, and, and your body couldn't handle, just ate a bunch of sugar stuff. So I eat stuff that I've been eating the, the white rice, one of my favorite, a little bit of dextrose maybe, but not too much sugar. A lot of people start snacking all kinds of, you know, whatever. But I also felt when I got hydrated, I was stronger. Intracellular water retention, I felt like a BOSU ball. I purposely did get kind of bloated, you know. I'd get on the weight scale and I'd have a six pack and then you'd see me with my belt on under the squat rack the next day and that thing would be hanging out like this. I'd just, I'd walk in doing warm-ups kind of, I ate probably an hour before I started warming up. And I ate in between every lift because I wanted to stay and, you know, hydrated. Nun tablets was helpful. Just however you can, pickles, bacon for breakfast. The focus is on carbs, salt, and water. If I want to say that. White rice, sodium, and water. Those three things are the major component. You don't need at that point a whole lot of protein or a whole lot of fat. Something to satiate you, something you typically ate. The proteins that you do eat at that point, I try and pull in a little bit, a couple pieces of bacon because of the salt. And I will have made sure to eat a couple pieces of bacon a few weeks prior as needed, so I'm assimilated to it. Those are the big three for coming to a meat full, hydrated, so that when you're lifting, just everything feels explosive.